Isildur was marching north along the east banks of the river, and near the Gladden Fields he was waylaid by the orcs of the mountains, and almost all his folk were slain. He leaped into the waters. He continued to swim, his will not foregoing his strength of arm. He swam across the waters of the Anduin with all the might he could, and his stealth was maintained by the ring on his finger, Sauron's ring. Isildur thought of it as he swam, a welcome distraction from the slaughter of his sons and his many other followers from the Battle of the Gladden Fields. As Isildur contemplated the ring, it threatened to slide off of his finger. For but a moment, Isildur wished that it would, that it would leave him in peace, a peace he had not felt since he had taken the War Guild from Sauron. However, he grasped his fist closed as he swam, and his will overcame that of the One Ring in this moment. Isildur brought his head above water when he came to land, and he was far enough away from the fight to run. Yet his sorrow overtook him, and he wept for his sons, and he cursed the orcs in a dark, vengeful fury. He grew fierce and untamed in that moment, ranting and muttering to himself that he would use his kingdom to destroy every last legacy of Sauron he could find, yet he did not know in his folly that, in that moment, the greatest legacy of Sauron would live on because of him. Asildor made his lonesome way over the Misty Mountains and back to Rivendell, where his wife and son Valandil were waiting. Otar, his squire, was amazed to see Asildor return to them, and he presented the shards of Narsil back to his king, which, by Asildor's command, he had brought to Rivendell. High King Asildor reclaimed them, and requested that they be reforged by the elves of Elrond Half-Elven into a new sword, worthy of the new High King of Arnor and Gondor. While the work on Narsil reforged, named Anarsil, the Light of the Sun, after Isildur's brother Anarion, continued, Isildur reunited with his son and wife, and he held counsel with Elrond and the other lords of Rivendell, telling them what befell him and his company on the road. With a passionate but cold rage, a terrible fire came to Isildur's eyes when he said that they in the West must prioritize the total destruction of Sauron's works and legacies, while of course leaving the one ring that was on a chain around his neck out of the conversation entirely, hiding it from the elven view. Elrond pondered this, as he and Círdan had witnessed Isildur taking the War Guild, as he had called it, from Sauron. And in this moment, the Lord of Rivendell even went so far to inquire about this ring. Do you still possess this terrible thing? Surely, after all we have learned about the rings of power in the last age, the Ring of Sauron himself must be something terrible and wicked. Perhaps it was even the reason for your waylay, and the deaths of your sons. Asildor would turn cold and pale, stating stoically, No, it was lost in the waters of Anduin during the battle, and none but you, Círdan, and my sons knew that I had it. It is beyond our reach now. Elrond detected this lie, for he had been wearing Vilya, his own ring, while Isildur had last worn the Ring of Sauron, but Elrond let the matter rest. Soon Narsil was reforged in its new form, and Isildur took leave of Rivendell with his family, going to the seat of Elendil in the realm of Arnor, which was the city of Anuminas upon the shore of Lake Nanuiel. From here Isildur ruled not only Arnor, but Gondor as well from a distance, as he was the High King. His nephew Meneldil was still king in Gondor, yet was subject to the rules of the High King, and he abdicated the throne of Minas Anor whenever Asildor visited. Asildor also ensured that Valandil, his son, would wield that same sort of power after him. Yet as the early decades and even centuries of the Third Age went on, and there was relative peace in the land, except for the crusades of men against orcs and other servants of Sauron in the wild, Asildor's rule began to falter in its virtue, yet men remarked that he must have been blessed indeed, for Isildur continued to rule and age, even past the days when other, lesser kings might have passed away, leaving the throne to their sons. He got old, but showed little sign of it. Yet Valandil and Meneldil aged far faster than even he did, or so it seemed to the men of those kingdoms, for Isildur was still so strong, even upon his 400th birthday. The men called him Isildur the Blessed for this, and they believed that his actions, both as a warrior and a high king, redeemed the blood of ancient Numenor, and his long life came from his royal blood and some sort of blessing by the Valar and Iru himself. 
Many even believed that Isildur might outlive Tar Menyatur, Elros of old, who saw the age of 500. Yet the elves, Elrond, Círdan, Glorfindel, Galadriel, and Celeborn, came to see this as the strange thing that it was. Isildur, even with his blood, should not have been so alive and unchanging for quite so long. And throughout all of this, Isildur maintained his control of the kingdoms of men, and from what they heard, as Isildur aged, he became more of an authority over his people, sending his men to colonize even other parts of the world, and he began to demand tribute from such lands, even as the Numenorians of old did. Valandil, in his old age, would come to Rivendell upon a time and voice his concerns for his father, claiming that the years had changed him, and a cold fire that had lit his eyes from time to time became more common. Isildur had taken to writing long scrolls and pondering ancient lore, even that of Aregion and Sauron of old, in his high chambers, locking himself away from his kin and people for days at a time. Therefore Elrond welcomed Valandil and his children to stay in Rivendell while they, the greatest of the elves, formed a group of emissaries to travel to Anuminas and speak with the High King. They were his allies, yet they had concerns for Sildor, greatest of the Numenorians left in the world. Sildor would receive them bitterly, as the One Ring and the use of his Palantir to spy on his own kingdoms and allies would have created a great paranoia within the man, and Sildor guessed that they came to take the ring from him. In some ways, he was not wrong as Elrond and Círdan shared their concerns about his long life and the changes to Isildur's personality with the other elves in their company, and attributed that, at least part of it, to the relic of Sauron that Isildur had cut from the Dark Lord's finger. Of course, they wouldn't know all of the lore of the One Ring, yet they would be able to figure out much of this, especially as it related to Isildur and his strange behavior over the years. Indeed, in this version of events, I feel that the elves would have far sooner pieced all of this together about the evil importance of the One Ring, and would have noted the effects that it had. Therefore, at this embassy of elves and men in Anuminas, Elrond would observe the actions of Isildur who sat upon his throne of stone, he who would cast unrighteous judgment upon them. Their talk would soon turn ill as the elves found not the friend they had once known within the son of Elendil, but rather, they would find a cold, tyrannical lord who looked upon adversaries to the maintenance of his power. The elves would leave this meeting without the High King's favor, and whispers went abound in Middle-earth over the contention between elves and men. Some would say that the elves wished to supplant the High King and install puppet rulers in the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor, while others said that the elves wished to save men from an ever more tyrannical king, like they did with Sauron. Soon, just as in Numenor of old, factions would form, and while some few stayed faithful to the elves, many others would align with Isildur, who would begin to call himself the Lord of the Earth, just as Sauron himself had. And so the elves would come to realize that the shadow of Sauron endured in Isildur and in his ring, and would indeed return in time, in one form or another, unless the ring was destroyed. And their fear of Isildur was not much less than the fear that they had had of Sauron himself, for this was no mere mortal that possessed the ring. No, it was the greatest of living men, the king of the heirs of Numenor. He already had a great power over fate and the lives of other men, he who had created the Oathbreakers. Indeed, I think he would use the One Ring to become a great tyrant and call all thralls that he could to him, and to set curses upon those whom he saw as enemies. Under his rule, Gondor and Arnor would be far more militaristic, and they would be ready to defend the son of Elendil, their high king, whom many still revered. The elves would then be faced with an impossible task between two options. To take the ring in combat and war with Isildur and attempt to destroy it and Sauron both before the Dark Lord could return in other ways, if the elves had the willpower to do this, plunging Middle-earth into more darkness, or leave the shores and the realms of men to their fate and not involve themselves in something that would inevitably become some sort of civil war, not only in the kingdoms of men, but between the children of Luvatar. 
Let me know which path you think the elves would have gone down in this impossible scenario. Regardless of which course would have been taken, Middle-earth would have faced a dark future had Isildur and the One Ring with him survived the disaster of the Gladden Fields, for there would have been an unbreakable link between the High King of the Descendants of Numenor and the greatest legacy of Sauron, the One Ring, and not even the elves probably could have saved Middle-earth at this point. While the disaster of the Gladden Fields was certainly that, a great disaster, the loss of the ring to the west in that time was not truly an evil, for such a relic of dark power in the hands of a man of great will, strength, and lineage would have brought tyranny and ruin to Middle-earth. And so with that sorrowful end, we come to the end of our tale. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all enjoyed today's theory video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on what if a sealed door had survived? Let me know in the comments below. In the lore, Sealdor passed on as a flawed hero of the West, but a legend all the same. Yet, here the One Ring would have changed him in so many ways, and would have brought the world to a quicker ruin, and a quicker return of Sauron's evil. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider getting some candles from our friends Mythology Candles, or order some Weta or United Cutlery Lord of the Rings sword statues and other replicas from Castle Khan, who does international shipping, and use the code WEST at checkout, and please check out our merch and Patreon. Thanks to our Valor Tier patrons and YouTube members, Peter Shepard, Blair Scott, and Merton, John Hume, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Arthur Merlin, Dale Davis, Kingswald Project, Theodore, Moon Viper, Andrew Carlisle, and Zumi. Thank you so much to all of our patrons and YouTube members. It really means a lot. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a video on what would happen if someone got all 20 rings of power. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.